Hello, BISC 132. This is the beginning of Recorded Lecture 1-1, and because this course is the, the second in a sequence of courses, um, with BISC 130 being the first, uh, we will not be starting with Chapter 1, we'll be starting with Chapter 20, uh, Phylogenies and the History of Life. So this course as a whole is going to be largely focused on um, the diversity of living things and you know different groups of living things from plants to animals to fungi uh, and this first chapter here is kind of short uh, but it's going to introduce us to some important concepts and terms that are going to help us organize things so that when we talk about all the different diversity that we see on this planet we can do so in a, an organized fashion so Again, just like with BISC 130, I, I try to follow the learning outcomes of, uh, of this um, OpenStax biology textbook. You don't have to worry about this stuff if you don't want to, but there is a document on Moodle that sort of shows all this stuff, and it, it shows uh, when I skip things if you want to read the textbook and follow through the textbook. So, okay, organizing life on Earth. Well, uh, at the top, let's go through some important terms. And, okay, so <laughs> another breakdown. Uh, because this is the second in a sequence, I am assuming that most of you uh, took BISC 130 with me, but I'm willing to recognize that there are probably some of you who may have transferred in or had someone else for BISC 130, or, or maybe it's just been a long time and you forgot. But uh, to review in these recorded lectures, when I come on slides like this that have uh, big text, this is the sort of stuff that I would normally be writing down on the document camera and displaying for everyone to see, or another pre professor might uh, have written these things down on a, a whiteboard or a chalkboard or something like that. Uh, this is like the text uh, that I think is sort of a distillation of the concept. These are like my notes about the subject. And uh, give you a little clue, when I write my tests, uh, I look through these notes and, and uh, the, you know, the text on these slides and say, hmm, what did I tell them about this stuff? And, and I can write test questions based on these. Uh, additionally, uh, I can write test questions based on these highlighted words. And yeah, there are a lot of these up top. It's not going to be this dense going forward, but uh, things that are highlighted are what I call key terms. These are vocabulary terms. I'm not going to write out the full definition on these slides. That would make things very cluttered. You will find the definitions of these terms um, in the textbook, but I, I've made it a lot easier for you. I've taken all the key terms that I use uh, and I've sorted them by chapter. I put them in a big Word document on Moodle called, I think it's called Key Terms or Master Key Terms or something like that. So uh, anyway, the, the first one uh, is taxonomy. And so um, just reading from that key terms document that you have available to you, taxonomy is defined as the science of classifying organisms. So this is the science of, of naming things and organizing living things. So the way we organize the things used to be sort of what they look like. Oh, does it have, you know, feathers? It's a bird. Does it have scales? It's a reptile. But what, what we're trying to do now, modern taxonomy, is trying to base this naming and this organization on something called phylogeny. Phylogeny, also in the key terms, uh, is the evolutionary history and relationship of an organism or a group of organisms. So we're trying to name things and organize things based on their evolutionary history, which, okay, that's, that's kind of abstract, but it becomes a lot, abstract, a lot less abstract uh, when we actually diagram this. So you can diagram the phylogeny of an organism in something called a phylogenetic tree. Again, key terms, a diagram that reflects the evolutionary relationships among organisms or groups of organisms. Let's look at one of these. Here is a, an example of a, a phylogenetic tree, uh, not just a phylogenetic tree, kind of the phylogenetic tree. This is, this is zoomed out uh, as, as far as you can go, pretty much, uh, because this shows uh, all living things on the planet are contained within this single phylogenetic tree. Um, and yeah, if we go, there's the, the star, you are here. Uh, that's where we are in the animals right here. And you can see we're somewhat closely related to fungi. And then, you know, there are plants also fairly close to us, all things considered. And, you know, these other groups that we're going to call protists when we get into this later on. Uh, and yeah, we have bacteria over here, another group called archaea. And yeah, this is the, the distance between these groups 
uh, represents how closely related they are evolutionarily. So animals, we are very distantly related uh, to spirochetes, for example, these bacteria. We, we shared a common ancestor way back here, uh, very early in the, the evolution of life on the planet, but there's a very distant removal between us and those spirochetes. H however, you know, spirochetes and uh, proteobacteria fairly closely related. So when we see a branch point Point like this, that means there was an ancestor uh, that experiences a speciation event due to you know, forces that we discussed in disc 130 that can lead to speciation, and uh, one descendant uh, went on to you know be the ancestor of this group, and a different descendant in that split point went on to be the ancestor to, to this group. So closely related, but very different from one another because of the differences that these two groups have accumulated. Uh, this this will make more sense when we get into specific ones. Again, this is kind of abstract because we haven't discussed any of these groups, but we'll we'll talk about bacteria. We'll talk about animals and fungi and plants and all that stuff. So this is just sort of the big one that's, that's zoomed out really far. Um, there are a couple of ways to draw these. Uh, the one we're looking at here, and, and here it is uh, again, a little cleaner, uh, is called a rooted phylogenetic tree. I, I kind of prefer this, you know, it's called rooted because it starts with a line at the bottom and sort of goes up like a, well, like a tree. Um, and, and most of the phylogenetic trees I'm going to use, you know, work this way. Uh, but you can also draw these unrooted. You may see these if you look at other textbooks or other sources or whatever, where instead of starting at the bottom, it starts in the middle and goes outwards. These are showing the exact same information. Uh, they're just representing it in, in different ways. So phylogenetic trees uh, can be drawn rooted or unrooted. As I said, those branch points represent speciation events. Uh, here's another important term, clades. Clades are complete branches. That includes an ancestor and all its descendants. Uh, another word for a clade is a, or another term for a clade is a monophyletic group. Let's go back to this. So uh, animals. So we've got a single ancestor and all of its descendants. That counts as a clade. That's a, that's a complete branch in this phylogenetic tree. Uh, but it doesn't have to be small. Uh, clades can also be large. If, if we look at this, this, this group that's organized in blue that we call bacteria, that is, you know, if we go back to the beginning, that's an ancestor and all of its descendants. Bacteria is a clade uh, as well. And again, this will make more sense when we look at more specific ones, but this is a term that's going to come up again and again and again throughout most of this quarter. Uh, we're trying to organize things uh, in, in phylogeny. We're trying to name groups based on uh, clades, monophyletic groups, which include an ancestor and all of its descendants. So yeah, modern taxonomy uh, is based on clades. <sighs> However, <laughs> uh, many uh, what I'm going to call traditional groups are actually not clades. What do I mean by a traditional group? Well, I mean something that uh, it's just embedded in the popular consciousness, something that we all know about and we're all familiar with, something like reptiles. We all know what a reptile is, you know, lizards and, and snakes and crocodiles and you know, stuff like that. But as it turns out, Crocodiles, or I'm sorry, um, reptiles are not a clade here. And again, this is an example. It'll make more sense when we talk about vertebrates. Um, this is showing mammals and several different groups, you know, turtles, lizards, crocodiles, birds. Uh, if we want to draw what reptiles are, uh, you know, birds are not reptiles and mammals are not reptiles. If we, if we wanted to draw uh, a, a shape around just the things that we call reptiles, it would be this thing in blue right here. And as you can see, that is not an ancestor and all of its descendants. If it was all of its descendants, it would have to include birds. And, you know, birds, as we'll see, uh, evolved from a specific group of reptiles. But yeah, birds are not reptiles in the common definition of reptile. So this group, uh, this what, what I can call a traditional group of, of reptiles is not an ancestor and all of its descendants. It's an ancestor and most of its descendants, but minus a group or two. So this is not called a monophyletic group. This is called a paraphyletic group. A paraphyletic group is 
a clade minus a, a group or a subgroup. So not everything. Additionally, there's a term called a polyphyletic group, a set of organisms not directly evolutionarily related at all. And, and this example uh, also shows that here in red, mammals and birds, uh, very distantly related. I mean, we, we share a common ancestor and some common traits if you go back here, uh, but mammals and birds do share a trait despite being distantly evolutionarily related. We are both warm-blooded. So if you wanted to create a group called uh, warm-blooded vertebrates, uh, you, you could make that group uh, and you could, you know, draw a weird little shape around both of these, excluding all these uh, quote-unquote cold-blooded reptiles. Uh, and what you would have created here is a polyphyletic group, a set of organisms not directly evolutionarily related. So we'll, we'll see these terms, especially monophyletic and paraphyletic, uh, throughout this entire quarter as we go through. This is just setting the groundwork with, with some of this terminology. Now, taxonomy is not just about uh, organizing things into, into visual displays. Taxonomy is also about naming things. And the taxonomic classification system, that's a mouthful, uh, the, the way of naming uh, specific things, has at least eight levels. So I'll explain the at least in a second. Uh, and each level is called a taxon. Let me show you what this means. So we have a taxon, a grouping called eukarya that includes, you know, uh, animals and plants and protists and fungi. This taxon here is the uh, most inclusive. It's a huge group. It includes a lot of different things. Um, if we want to get more specific, we can go to the next taxon, kingdom. In, in this specific example, kingdom animalia. Now we're talking about animals. So you've got, you know, you've got mammals and mollusks and cnidarians and, and other invertebrates. It's still a fairly large group, but it's more exclusive. This doesn't include plants or fungi anymore. We can get more specific in this example and go to phylum, the phylum level chordata. So now we're talking about things with a dorsal nerve cord that includes uh, vertebrates, but it also includes these weird non-vertebrates we'll see in later chapters. Uh, next we have, in this particular example, what's called a subphylum. So this is why I said there are at least eight levels. Uh, in, in taxonomy, there are at least eight, but sometimes you have sub-taxa or super-taxa. It, you know, it's, it's life. It's living things on this planet. Evolution doesn't follow some rule about, oh, you can only have eight speciation events or something like that. This is that's just our way of trying to, to make some sort of sense of the, the chaos that is life on this planet. So anyway, that's why it's kind of frustratingly not clean. Uh, so anyway, in this particular example, we're talking about subphylum vertebrata. So we're talking about vertebrates, things with a, a spinal cord. Uh, the next specific taxon is mammalia. So now we're talking about mammals. So these are primates and uh, and rodents and you know, not pictured bats. Um, order, next taxon, rodentia. Oh, we got rodents here, mice and rats and squirrels. S family, scyridae. Oh, so now we're talking about chipmunks and squirrels, getting even more specific. Genus, scirrus. Okay, now we're just talking about squirrels, but there are a lot of squirrels on this planet. If we want to be the most specific possible, here is the species taxon. Carolinensis, this is the eastern gray squirrel, and that is a very, very specific organism. And we've gone from domain to species, going from the most inclusive, including a bunch of diverse different stuff, to the most exclusive, uh, being as, as specific as possible. So again, that was just an example. Don't memorize the, you know, the rodentia and mammalia and all, all that stuff for that specific example, but what you should know uh, are these taxa. From the biggest, most inclusive to the smallest, most exclusive, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Or, if you want to put this into one letter, D-K-P-C-O-F-G-S. That doesn't really spell anything memorable. Uh, you can definitely make a mnemonic out of this. Um, 
you can Google these if you're uh, phenomenally uncreative. I'm not going to give you a mnemonic at all because I honestly think you'll remember it better if you make it up yourself. Uh, make it as specific as possible. Make it as weird as possible. Whatever it is, DKPCOFGS. If, if, if you make you know one of these for yourself, you'll remember it a lot better than something you'll Google up. But I'll leave that to you. Uh, and as I noted going through the squirrel example, some organisms, and we'll see this again later in the, in the course, uh, are gonna have some taxa. So that's why I said at least eight, sometimes more. So another sort of naming convention, uh, these final two taxa, the genus and the species, in this case, Scurus and Carolinensis, uh, these final two taxa, genus and species, make up an organism's two word name. Uh, every single species has a specific two-word name to refer to them in, in specific. This is called binomial nomenclature, and there are a couple of rules associated with this when you're referring to a species uh, name, you know, the binomial nomenclature. It should always be in italics, or if you're handwriting, underlined. This is to sort of separate it from the rest of the sentence to let you know you're talking about a specific species. Uh, the other convention is the first word in this two-word nomenclature is always capitalized, and despite what autocorrect may do for you, uh, the second word uh, should never be capitalized. So other than Scurus carolinensis, another good example is us, humans. Our binomial nomenclature name is Homo sapiens. And here we see in italics, capital H in our genus Homo, lowercase s in our species sapiens. Uh, we are the, the thinking apes, uh, is what you could call this. And so, yeah, that's just one example of this. We'll see this a lot throughout the quarter. Now, back to this. Um, you may have noticed, again, I said this was zoomed out as far as possible, that uh, on, a, on a very broad level, we can define three major groups that include all living things. Uh, th this is the, the domain level. So in this example, we were doing domain eukarya and eventually made our way down to squirrel. Uh, but there are three domains, including eukarya, archaea, and bacteria. So you should be familiar with this going forward. Three domains of all living things, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Okay, now th these are cool, you know, graphs. These are cool, you know, displays of things. And I, I explained what they're supposed to mean, that oh, animals closely related to fungi and distantly related to diplomonads. But uh, a good question you might be wondering is, how did, how did we come up with this? How do, you, how do you draw this and know that it's correct and, and know that it's accurate? Well, there are a couple of ways uh, that can be used to, to design these and to, and to put these together. So de determining evolutionary relationships. How do we know this? Well, the, the old school way, which is still done to an extent, uh, is evolutionary relationships, you know, who's related to, to whom and, and you know, to what extent, are inferred based on what are called homologous traits. So homologous traits are similar physical features. Here's an example if we look at vertebrates. This is the arm of a human, a dog, a bird, a whale, and despite the superficial differences that you find between a whale and a bird or a dog, uh, there are a lot of similarities here in the arm and hand bones. And in fact, it's basically the same bones uh, in all of these groups. I mean, it's been you know, shorter in a whale because they have shorter sort of stubbier arms with longer fingers, but you know, that the radius and the ulna are still there and the humerus and, and, and these wrist bones, it's, you see a lot of similarity here structurally, even though they've been modified to fulfill different functions, you know, whether it's swimming or flight or grabbing things or walking and bearing weight, uh, it, it's the same basic structure found in all of these groups. What that leads biologists to infer is these groups of vertebrates, uh, mammal or animals, so vertebrates, uh, share a common ancestor. Uh, 
So we know the way you know, things are passed down, the way speciation events work. If all of these groups have you know, a humerus and a radius and an ulna and these wrist bones and they, they all have you know, fingers, uh, there must have been some common ancestor to all of these uh, that had this trait and all of these groups share this trait because they share a common ancestor. So uh, that's what homologous traits are physical features derived from a common ancestor. Uh, these homologous traits are also known as synapomorphies. So that is, you know, looking at different groups of things and saying, oh, hey, you know, all these things have uh, scales. Uh, they must be closely related because they all come from uh, an ancestor that had scales. Or, you know, all of these things have a certain number of teeth in their skulls, so they must come from an ancestor that had, you know, teeth that were arranged in this way. You can see a lot of these throughout the quarter. Uh, homologous traits are used to, to, to build these relationships. But, but it can, it's not always so straightforward. Using physical traits, comparison of physical traits can be confusing due to what are called analogous traits. So analogous traits are traits that do a similar thing, but are structurally and evolutionarily different. We need an example for this. Wings. So a butterfly has wings, a bat has wings. And if you were looking for homologous traits, you would, you would conclude, oh, hey, you know, butterflies and bats must be closely related. They both have these wings. I mean, look at how similar they are. They're, they're paired, you know, one on either side of, of the body, symmetrical down the middle. Uh, and, and they have this wide surface area here. Uh, they have this trait in common. Therefore, they must be closely evolutionarily related. <sighs> but that's not quite true. These are not homologous traits, these are analogous traits. They fulfill the same function, enabling this animal to fly, but they're not due to a common ancestor. And you know the difference between an analogous structure and a homologous structure only by looking at it very closely. While these are both wings and they allow their respective animals to fly, if you look closely, a bat wing is, well, there's bone in here and, and there's, there's skin and, and blood vessels, but in the butterfly wing, oh, this is, uh, you know, this is chitin and this is, you know, thin and membranous. There's no blood here. There's no bones here. These two things both uh, and allow them to fly, uh, but they're very, very structurally different if you look at them closely. So you can't always say, oh, they, they have same physical features, they're, they're closely evolutionary, evolutionarily related. Well, uh, sometimes that's analogous similarities, and you, you really just... No, no one knows physiology more better uh, than, a, than an evolutionary biologist, but you have to look closely uh, at the details of these structures uh, to know whether the similarity is homologous due to a common ancestor or analogous due to just fulfilling the same function in a different way. So analogous traits, traits that fulfill a similar function but are structurally and importantly evolutionarily different. These two groups uh, evolve the ability to, of flight independently from one another. And by bringing up the possibility that these two distantly related groups, butterflies and bats, uh, managed to evolve very similar looking structures or wings in order to fulfill the same function of you know, allowing them to fly, we've stumbled upon an important concept in evolutionary biology, the concept of what is called convergent evolution. Convergent evolution defined in the key terms as a process by which groups of organisms independently evolve to similar forms. So this is another thing that makes all this uh, very, very confusing. It's where you have two distantly related groups that basically come up with the same idea independently of one another. Uh, here's another example. Don't sweat all the details here, but you know this is showing you just how many similarities there are between ichthyosaurs, 
a group of extinct marine reptiles, and dolphins, which are mammals. So mammals and reptiles are pretty distantly related to, from one another, but man, their bodies are so similar. You know, their, their heads have a similar shape. They both have this dorsal fin. Uh, they both have lost or highly reduced hind limbs. They give birth in a similar way. There are, there are so many physical similarities, you would be tempted to conclude that they're closely related to one another. But looking at things more closely, uh, looking at, you know, their metabolism and, you know, other aspects that you know make these things reptiles and make these things mammals uh, you say oh no these are these are very different groups uh but selective pressure evolution they're living basically the same lifestyle in the ocean uh th these same selective pressures at different points in the planet's history sort of pushed them to evolve very similar body plans because if you're going to be uh, you know, a marine predator, uh, this is a really good body plan. This is just a good idea. Selective pressure is going to cause you to look like this because it's, it, it's a good way to do it. Uh, another fun example here is uh, these saber-toothed uh, cats, these saber-toothed uh, mammals. Here's the uh, Smilodon up here, and here's the Thylacosmilus down here. And yeah, you, you can see some differences, you know, their tails or whatever, but man, these things look very closely related. And at first glance, you might say, yeah, th these are, are very closely related to one another. But if you look more closely at the, their metabolism, you know, the different aspects of their skeletal structure and, you know, for the fine details of things, uh, this is going to be a group of placental mammals more closely related to us. And this is a a metatherian, it's basically a marsupial, Basic, basically a marsupial, uh, which is, is very, very distantly related uh, from these placental mammals, despite these looking almost identical. And again, this happened because if you're going to be a large ambush predator trying to take down some large prey, having these giant front teeth for stabbing into something, it, it's, it's just a good way to, to go about this. So they have the same selective pressures despite existing in very different parts of the world. And so they convergently evolved this same basic body plan. So we're, we're gonna see this a lot. So physical similarities between groups are, you know, are, are the basis for defining evolutionary relationships, but it's always possible for two different groups to come up with the same idea independently of one another. Uh, and the, the only way to sort of you know, suss this out is to look very closely at the details of, of the physiology of these, uh, of these organisms to see, is it convergent evolution or is it an actual evolutionary relationship? Now, this comparison of physical traits is, uh, as I said at the top, kind of an old school way of doing things. A more modern approach to taxonomy is based on computational analysis of gene or protein sequences. So here's just a small example of what this can look like. And, and yes, this gets very maddening very quickly. Here's the the protein sequence of a, a protein called histone H1. Uh, we're comparing the amino acid sequence of this protein between human and mouse and rat and cow and chimpanzee. Don't memorize this, please. But what I'm trying to point out is the protein here is very similar in all of these groups. I mean, human, mouse, rat, cow, chip, these are, these are all mammals. Of course, we're closely related on some level. So there's a lysine here and a lysine and an alanine. Uh, oh, and, and then there's a difference here, a serine in humans and chimps and an alanine in, in these other groups. And then, you know, lysine, proline, lysine, lysine, alanine, alanine, and all these similarities. But what we're noticing just, you know, from these 60 residues uh, is the differences that exist here, chimpanzees and humans are actually similar in the way that, the, that we are different. Uh, leucine here instead of proline, the, the way that we differ from you know, mouse, rat, and, and cow uh, is very similar to one another. And yeah, this, this, is, uh, this becomes too um, 
complex and this is only part of one protein uh, way too complex to do manually on your own uh, there is a sort of venn diagram overlap between biology and computer science in the field of bioinformatics uh, and you know, a part of that is taking these sequences and aligning them and picking out the differences and using these genetic differences to say, oh, humans and chimpanzees look like they're closely evolutionarily related because their sequences are more similar to one another than they are to the sequences of, you know, some of these other mammals. So that's, that, again, that's the modern way to do this without getting bogged down into the details uh, in an intro class, uh, that, you know, computational analysis of gene or protein sequences is a more modern way to define evolutionary relationships. Again, the assumption is you got your genes from your ancestor. If you have similar gene or protein sequences, you must have a, a close ancestor. However, this can also be uh, confounded uh, due to something called horizontal gene transfer. Uh, so this computational approach can be mucked with due to this. So what is horizontal gene transfer? Well, the, the key terms define this as uh, also known as lateral gene transfer, the transfer of genes between unrelated species. We need an example for this because that sounds too weird. So here are some aphids. Uh, insects feeding on um, you know, sap, basically, from plants. Uh, and here are some other aphids that you know, live in a very similar way, but they've, they've got this sort of uh, reddish-brown rust color. And if you sequence the genomes of these aphids and, and you try to figure out what's making these aphids red, uh, you will find a gene that is almost identical to the gene from a specific species of fungus. You know, you line up, you know, the, the sequences here and, oh, the, the red pigment gene in these aphids and the red pigment gene in this fungus, they're almost exactly the same. So based on that, you would conclude that these aphids are closely related to fungus. And that would be wrong. <laughs> There's, this is not, you know, some convergent evolution that a fungus evolved into an aphid convergently with these aphids. Yes, their gene sequence is very similar to the gene sequence of the fungus, but it's because they live in close association with this fungus, which oftentimes infects the same plants that they are feeding on. And you know, this doesn't happen all the time, but just living in close association with these genes, uh, those genes had become, somehow, had become integrated into their chromosome. So this is called horizontal gene transfer because vertical gene transfer is when you pass on uh, genes to your descendants, from ancestor to descendants. Horizontal, it's called horizontal because it's it's not a, a fungus ancestor passing these genes on to its aphid descendants it's not that uh, it's sort of side by side the fungus and the aphid uh, acquiring genes from one another I guess the aphid getting the genes from the fungus there's no evolutionary relationship here between the aphid and the fungus it just acquired this fungal gene and again like I said this can make things confusing because it is a sequence that aligns. You might conclude that they're closely related, but nope. Horizontal gene transfer is turning this into a headache. So again, these are just a few examples of all of this taxonomy. Again, this is an, an introductory chapter. Uh, in fact, I'm skipping a lot of this stuff because it's either beyond the scope of the course or we'll get into this in later chapters. Uh, but yeah, a lot of this stuff might make more sense uh, when we see more specific examples of this further in the quarter. And yeah, we're going to talk about monophyletic groups and phylogenetic trees and stuff uh, Yeah, many, many times as we go through the quarter. Now, uh, as long as this lecture seems already, uh, it's not uncommon for me to finish a chapter and within the same lecture, start on the next chapter. Uh, this is because, you know, in a 75 minute 
you know, in-person class period. Uh, I want to use as much time as I can. Uh, and, you know, typically I haven't run out of time yet after finishing this chapter 20. Uh, and so we're going to continue on with this recorded lecture 1-1, uh, starting briefly uh, on chapter 21, viruses. So, as we will do in, uh, in future chapters, let's go back to, to this. Again, this is supposed to include all living things on the entire planet. So if we're going to talk about viruses, let's, uh, let's find where they are before we go forward. Well, if you're looking for them, you're going to be here a while. Viruses are not here. And this is not an omission. This is because this is the phylogenetic tree of life, of living things on this planet. Viruses are actually not alive. They're not living things. So they are, they can be found nowhere on this phylogenetic tree of life. Sorry for trying to trick you. Um, they do exist, uh, but they're called non-cellular entities. So viruses, just to talk about these in general, <clears throat> non-cellular. They're not made of cells. This is one of the defining features of life. All living things have to have one or more cells. Viruses don't. So we don't consider them to be alive. Uh, a good uh, phrase to describe them is to call them parasitic macromolecules. Uh, so yeah, there are a genetic sequence inside a protein shell that you know steal stuff from a host. They're parasites, and yeah, they're not cells. They're not alive. Parasitic macromolecules. And just to get into sort of the history of virology, these were very difficult to to detect for a very long time because, and it, it's, it's difficult to conceptualize this sort of stuff, but I think it's very important going forward. Uh, viruses are much smaller than cells. So here's an old uh, slide that I used in BISC 130, but I'm pulling it back up again, just sort of the, the scale of things. Uh, an animal cell you know, is, is about here. If we go a tenth the size, there's a, a bacterial cell. If we go a tenth the size of that, there is the flu virus, which is actually one of the bigger viruses that are out there. You can get even smaller than that in other viruses. But yeah, that's less than a hundredth of the size uh, of you know your typical animal or plant cell. So if you're looking at stuff under a microscope, you know, trying to identify bacteria, uh, you're not going to be able to see a virus under you know a standard compound light microscope, uh, which again, from a historical standpoint, made the diseases caused by viruses very difficult to, to detect and diagnose because these can't be seen by our, our typical ways of, of viewing uh, microbes because they're so small. Um, and their origin is not understood. I mean, we uh, you know try to organize how living things arose or how they evolved from other living things, but where viruses came from, I mean, there are a lot of interesting hypotheses, but I'm just going to say not understood because we do not clearly know uh, where these things came from. So to talk about what they are structurally, they are genetic material. And the reason I'm using the phrase genetic material instead of just saying DNA is because it can be DNA or RNA. And this is weird. All living things use DNA as their genetic material, and RNA is just a, a short-term copy. But there are plenty of viruses out there whose genome, whose you know, basic genetic stored material, is in a molecule of RNA. So it can be DNA or RNA uh, inside a protein capsid. Capsid is defined in the key terms, of course, because it's highlighted. It is a protein coating of the viral core. And uh, the capsid can come in several different shapes and sizes. These are the most common ones. Helical capsids are sort of like a, a tube. Uh, it, it is hollow in the middle. The, the DNA or, or the RNA is, is fit in there. and It sticks in due to you know, protein DNA interactions, uh, but it is open at the ends. Icosahedral is supposed to be a 20-sided icosahedron uh, with you know, genetic material inside. And this cool like space lander, really alien sci-fi looking thing uh, is called binal or head and tail symmetry. And, and it's both of these things together, essentially, an icosahedral head uh, and, and then a helical sort of tail with the uh, Weird little spider leg things uh, being optional, but often included. So common capsid morphologies. 
Helical is a rod slash tube. Icosahedral is an icosahedron, which is a, a polygon with 20 sides. And vinyl symmetry, also known as head and tail symmetry. An icosahedral head and a helical uh, sheath. Now, all viruses have genetic material and a capsid of you know, one shape or another. Some viruses have, some, not all viruses, some viruses additionally have a structure called an envelope or envelope, whatever. Uh, envelope is defined in the key terms, a lipid bilayer that encircles some viruses. So here's an example of, of what this can look like. Uh, yep, there's the capsid, uh, there is the genome inside, and yep, here's the envelope. It is a, a lipid bilayer with proteins and other stuff embedded in it. This looks a lot like a cell because, you know, a cell has a, a lipid bilayer, uh, but as we're gonna see, they did not build this themselves, this uh, this envelope, they, they stole from their previous host as they were exiting it. So that's where the envelope comes from. And again, I don't know why I'm putting such a hard point on this, but, but this is an optional feature. Some viruses have an envelope, some just no envelope uh, at all. Now, I mentioned that viruses are not found on you know, this phylogenetic tree of life. But, you know, they do have genetic material and they are subject to selective pressures and evolution. So you can build a phylogenetic tree of viruses to track the, the relationships between different groups of viruses. <sighs> But that is not easy, or uh, some would say impossible. Viruses are difficult to classify evolutionarily. The major reason for this is they do not have genes in common with one another as a point for comparison. So to go back to this example, when we were doing a, a sequence alignment between human, mouse, rat, cow, chimpanzee, we were able to do this because all these animals all have this same gene. In fact, all animals, all eukaryotes have this gene. So there's something that we all have in common that we can use as a point of comparison. But viruses are all so very different from one another that they don't have. There is no gene that all viruses have that you could use to, to line up to compare them to one another. Uh, viruses have an incredibly small number of, of genes, and yeah, they, they just don't have anything in common uh, to, to be able to do this. So despite that, there have still been attempts to try to classify viruses into different groups. And there, there's no one right answer here, so I'm just going to throw out some of these. Viruses can be classified based on their genome structure. So you can divide them into DNA viruses and RNA viruses, or they could be classified based on capsid morphology. So helical viruses, icosahedral viruses, vinyl viruses, or, and this is the weirdest one, but it's actually the one that is getting the most traction, has the most support, classifying viruses on how they make their mRNA. And, not getting into the details of this, but there are a lot of different ways to go about this, and it's very technical, and that this seems to be a good way to sort of split viruses into different groups. But all I want you to know is that th these are the basic different ways to try to, to separate viruses into evolutionary groups, but it's not easy. Okay, we are definitely not done talking about viruses. We've just scratched the surface, in fact, but this is typically where I run out of time in a normal in-person 75-minute lecture. Uh, so this is the end of recorded lecture 1-1.